Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, let's move through this. Um, this is what I'm normally doing on a Saturday afternoon, actually. So, uh, my my my, um, my little one has a sleep, and I usually stay home and supervise while the other two go to the park. So, uh, I hope you've had some coffee this afternoon. Um, the talk I'm going to give is reasonably similar to a. Uh, a book aimed at sort of her age, which is a lot of illustrations with uh, not too much in the way of um, of, uh, of data, etc. We'll move through it as we see fit. Um, this is actually the first uh, picture we've seen today of the left atrial appendage that's not a, a imaging picture, which I think is interesting. We've got to the end of the day. So this is uh, the surgeon's view of structural heart, really, which is uh, from the outside looking in or the inside looking out, whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, this is doing an off-pump cabbage. Left atrial appendage is a very definite structure. Uh, it sits over next to the, uh, uh, the pulmonary trunk. And you can certainly see, looking at this, how, um, what's I'm looking for, tempting it is, or tempting for me anyway, to remove this structure. And I'll go through the logic of that as we go through. Um, Digital is, capture recording. I'll just get rid of, uh, turn that off. Um, this is, uh, our view, this is the office uh, of, of most surgeons, is, is looking at this is certainly structural heart disease. This is a 69 year old Digital lady. Digital capture recording. We just turn the vo it's going to do this the whole way through otherwise. Um, this is a 69 year old lady with uh, mitral stenosis that has been watched. Uh, so she's got functional tricuspid regurgitation. She had uh, moderate aortic regurgitation as well. So she came for a triple valve procedure. She's been in atrial fibrillation for 10 years. Uh, we used bioprostheses, did a biotrial cryomase, resected her atrial appendage. She's now in sinus rhythm off warfarin. So that's a good thing. But atrial fibrillation looks like this. My son, who's four, looked at this this morning as I was going through my thing and said, what's that ugly purple thing, Daddy? And he's right, actually. This is an atrium that's very unwell. Uh, this is obviously the right atrium, uh, but similarly on the left side you can see there's no, not much in the way of mechanical function. So uh, atrial fibrillation is not a benign uh, condition and it's very common. Um, this is the increased incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation um, as you go through the years. So certainly in the group of patients that I tend to get sent, I think either everyone's in AF or they get AF, uh, it's almost 100%. Um, and certainly uh, it becomes such a common condition that we tend to sometimes put in the, new, in the too hard basket. And I thought that David Wally's um, data of if you did three a day, uh, every day for 52 weeks a year uh, across all centres in Australia, you could only treat 6% of patients. So I think it's an, uh, atrial fibrillation is, is an extreme, it's almost a, a pandemic, it's of that proportion. Um, but certainly if you're doing open heart surgery, it is useful to be able to try and address that. Now the CHAD score, uh, is interesting. It's a 12-month score, not a, a daily score. So uh, certainly in the private sector, and, and Jason, who I work with uh, uh, here in, in the private sector regularly, there is a temptation to want to um, anticoagulate people on a daily basis rather than an annual basis. And we'll go through that in terms of the, the risk of oral anticoagulation versus the benefit. But certainly as patients get older and the population is ageing, as we know, and um, uh, the comorbidities of that population increases, the, the CHAD score is a certain thing. And obviously it's a, a matter of... Um, uh, anticoag that should be sorry, it's a type of the anticoagulation, uh, either bleeding versus versus clotting, and that is the dilemma that we face. And we, we face that dilemma uh, certainly from a surgical point of view in the acute phase. Patients who have uh, um, very rarely these days mechanical prostheses uh, and other reasons for having um, anticoagulation. Certainly, atrial fibrillation is probably the most common one uh, where there is a desire to anticoagulate people in the post-operative period. Um, obviously, you've got to weigh that up against uh, embolic strokes. And embolic strokes are obviously devastating. Uh, embolic stroke, anything from a minor reversible thing through to a full-blown stroke that causes death or certain uh, incapacitation that forces someone into a nursing home or uh, prevents them from recognising their spouse or being able to do the things that they want to do versus anticoagulation. Certainly, there is somewhat of a disconnect, and this is, uh, I've got to be careful in the way I make this statement, a disconnect between the person writing the script versus the person that deals with a problem uh, with anticoagulation. Certainly we've all seen in our junior days and certainly in current times is bleeding into the brain and obviously as people get older their brains shrink and they fall and obviously that is a big problem with anticoagulation. Um, I found this on Google, it's quite a graphic slide but there's, I googled warfarin bleeding and uh, this picture came up and so, um, and so clearly warfarin is, is a problem or any anticoagulation is a problem um, and certainly as people get older they get more procedures 
Uh, this is a referral from one of our EP physicians to us to sort this problem out. The patient was deemed too high risk to come off their anticoagulation and they had a device and certainly um, this is the problem that I see often with anticoagulation is that you almost certainly will get problems, particularly in the bridging patients who get uh, heparin or clexane, you will get large hematomas. And the other thing too is as people get older, uh, the incidence of needing other procedures, uh, knee replacements, uh, gallbladder operations, prostate surgery, uh, etc., is very, very common. So if you're 65 years old and you put onto anticoagulation for the rest of your life and, and on a statistical basis you would live to 85, that's 20 years of anticoagulation and you're going to probably have a couple of other invasive procedures as well. It makes it quite problematic. So with that in mind, um, uh, the other thing also from my point of view with anticoagulation is in the perioperative period and there's obviously statistical things and I can't offer you those statistics but I find that if you do an operation that shrinks the heart which is most valvular surgery particularly mitral regurgitation surgery, atrial septal defect surgery at the end of the operation the heart is smaller than when you started and if you close the pericard in there is a potential space and I find that the potential space usually fills with fluid which I need to drain on a Friday, which is my operating day, and my colleagues who anticoagulate patients routinely, I'm very used to draining the fluid from around their, their patients' hearts. So there is, there is a, a problem with the perioperative period of anticoagulation uh, that is not insignificant. Um, I promise to have uh, not too much data, but I'll have a little bit of data just to try and add some, at least a little bit of science and a bit of evidence to what I'm talking about. Um, the first thing is, I think, is not an unreasonable thing within surgery is the concept of biological plausibility. Now the atrial appendage to me, it's a very, very simple thing. Um, there it is in, uh, in obviously a post-mortem uh, fixed specimen. Um, that is where the thrombus forms. If you remove the uh, left atrial appendage uh, effectively, then the thrombus can't form. And I think that is a reasonable, uh, a reasonable hypothesis. Certainly 90% uh, is the quoted uh, number of um, of where the, uh, the thrombus forms in, uh, in atrial fibrillation is uh, within the appendage. And so logic would have it that if you remove the atrial appendage, then you remove 90% of patients' um, uh, potential to have uh, emboli. The other thing too is there's a concept of thing which is called an anticoagulation holiday. And the anticoagulation holiday is the week or so in the perioperative period for thing, other things that you need to have. And as I said, if you're bridging people with heparin or clexane, that is the most dangerous period for them to have uh, these uh, procedures. If you've had an atrial uh, appendage removal or resection, even though you're on anticoagulation, I think when you come off your anticoagulation for your other procedure, then you're in a much safer space. Um, certainly, uh, the atrial uh, appendage, this is a resected atrial appendage, uh, from the literature, uh, which shows a, 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 an atrial appendage clot. Logically, if you remove the appendage, then you remove the clot, and I'll go through that uh, shortly. There is a lot of bad press, and I'm sure that the advocates of Watchmen and other things will quote a lot of the surgical literature, which is from the, the 90s and the early 2000s, about failed um, uh, atrial appendage um, occlusions, and certainly ligation and other things uh, has not worked. And I'll show you my own experience shortly with that. Um, but a lot of these are fairly small series, of about 50 patients or so, and I think that they are used badly as evidence in, when there's literature out there to show that it's actually a good thing to do to not do it. And obviously if you need to do atrial appendage occlusion, you need to occlude the atrial appendage, you need to show that at the end of the procedure. I think the surgical failure, and this is a failure of the surgeons and the failure of the surgical craft group, has led to the rise of um, uh, a bunch of uh, expensive uh, devices which are of variable effectiveness. Um, and I think that the, the industry driving things, these are obviously very expensive um, and there's a certain place for them. But I think as surgeons, if we uh, look at the atrial appendage a little bit more closely, then I think we can offer a, uh, an alternative uh, to that or perhaps even a complementary approach. We don't have this type of data in the surgical literature, which I think is a real shame. And obviously, the Watchman, the Watchman data, which is probably the most uh, comprehensive uh, uh, looked at device, and certainly is a very good device, um, shows that if you occlude the atrial appendage or exclude the atrial appendage, which, whichever way you want to talk about it, you'll get better than the controls. And it would be nice to see this type of data in surgery, which unfortunately we don't have. Obviously the, uh, these devices are not without their problems and um, I didn't choose this because it was from our institution, I chose it because I found it on the, my PubMed search when I was doing my talk the other day. Um, but certainly um, a, a catastrophic uh, erosion 
of the struts through the very thin-walled left atrial appendage uh, into the uh, adjacent uh, pulmonary artery, resulting in a pretty catastrophic end for the patient. So these devices are not without their issues. Um, and obviously a couple of them actually been uh, recalled. On the left is the uh, Tiger Paw device, which I used to carry around in my bag. Actually, I had a one th we're just desperately waiting for it to be um, uh, approved in Australia so we could use it. And there's the Lariat device, which is the, um, an atrial ligation device um, that's actually an Ethibon, which is a stitch. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit more as we go through. Um, a lot of the stapler, the old stapler uh, data comes from, I think, using what, what are called TL staplers, not, uh, not the, uh, the TLC or the, the NWGA staplers that we use. And a lot of them is very old technology where the surgeons fail to get to the base of the appendix to have a very large residual stump. And I think that it would be um, unfair to staplers to um, compare the old data of staplers to the modern technology. And I'll show you with some pretty obvious videos shortly what I mean. Obviously, over-sewing of the left atrial appendage orifice is, uh, in theory, a great thing. And, and I remember Michael Yee gave a talk at a techno practicum and said it's a simple suture line, it should work. Even in the best hands, this doesn't always work. You're, you're sewing on a flaccid, empty heart uh, using fairly uh, thin tissue. And all you need is one of these stitches to pull out and you've got a communication uh, with TOE. And I'm sure all of the TOE doctors here have seen small jets into, um, into perfused, for want of a better word, patent uh, left atrial appendages. I certainly use this for minimally invasive mitral surgery because it's very difficult, obviously, to get to left atrial appendage. And I've stopped using this um, now that I've developed, you know, in terms of using the stapler technology. Um, there's lots of data out there. This is a very nice um, meta-analysis that was published in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery last year from uh, Tristan Yan's group. And basically it shows that if you're having atrial fibrillation surgery, you should have your atrial appendage dealt with, which going back to biological plausibility, I think um, it's nice to have this data, but I think from the beginning, if you remove the appendage, then you're going to have uh, less issues when it comes to um, uh, problems. Now, this is a paper that I need to write with my data um, because it, it pretty much parallels my experience with the atrial fibrillation, uh, with, with the, the um, uh, removal of the, atrial, of the left atrial appendage either by resection or by exclusion. Now, the surgeon uh, Norbert Baumgartner, who's the surgeon that kind of advocated this within the group, he was noting that they were having a lot of atrial fibrillation related CVAs and obviously started, and I'll just go through here, started ligating appendages back here, and early he was having suture ligation, and then he was having resection or an over or stapling, and he pretty clearly, similar to what I did, got very enthusiastic about it, and now I'm sitting right up here as well. And what you'll see is that his uh, AF and the CVAs, uh, um, uh, sorry, this, I'll show you in the next slide actually. And so he obviously went, went crazy with, with doing all that. What he also noted was that the complexity of his work increased, and that happens as you become a more senior surgeon, you don't get cabbages, you get lots more valves and other things. So he was having more patients having atrial fibrillation in the post-operative periods and less patients having stroke as he resected the appendage. And certainly from a data point of view, they had a very large group of patients, some 2,000 patients, and they propensity matched um, those patients. There were 630 patients in each group. Uh, and there was 20% of patients, which is a bit lower than my group. I think about 99.8% of my patients get atrial fibrillation after surgery. But interestingly, and I think quite uh, compelling data is that in the left atrial occlusion group, zero patients had strokes. And in the no left atrial occlusion group, there was 6% of patients had strokes. That's obviously quite high. And there was no serious or adverse events from left atrial appendage exclusion. I found one other paper. Um, many years ago, which I couldn't find for this talk, and it, the title was, Is the Left Atrial Appendage the Most Dangerous Appendage in the Human Body? And they showed exactly the same results, which is in some four or 500 patients with left atrial occlusion. Now, um, my niece, one of my nieces, Saul Uderman, uh, described it was uh, Mike's war against the left atrial appendage, and the nieces have a lot of um, humour at me with the left atrial appendage and my obsession with that, and I'll go through why that should be the case. Now, I suppose at some point you have to establish yourself uh, as an expert or at least an interested party. And certainly in my practice, which is some, some of it's by design and some of it by the way my career has gone, that I spend a lot of time operating on very elderly patients, either as rejects, the John West patients that come through the TAVI and MitraClip program, or in the, um, 
I, I do all my, my surgery in an antibiotic no touch fashion, so I tend to get um, patients referred specifically in a very elderly and high risk group for coronary surgery. So I tend to sit in that space. And I find that anticoagulation in this population is a disaster, and also strokes it is a disaster. And so what I'm trying to achieve is zero stroke coronary surgery, and that's where the premise came from. Um, there's a very nice paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, some 10 or so years ago. And this is for all surgery, not for cardiac surgery, for all surgeries. And 60% of strokes in the perioperative period are from emboli. And so I think if you can eliminate emboli, then you'll certainly halve your stroke rate. And that's certainly what we found with our coronary artery surgery, exactly that. Our on-pump coronary artery uh, stroke rate's about 1.2, and our off-pump coronary artery stroke rate's about 0.5. So um, it is what it is, and that's with uh, many hundreds of cases. Now, what I first started to do, and the reason that I used to do this was I've done all my coronaries off pump now for many, many years. And one of the issues we're getting to lateral wall, particularly with the high intermediate things, is the left atrial appendage is in the way. And as patients get older with higher left atrial pressure, they get very big and gorge left atrium. So what I used to do was ligate the appendage with an endo loop. In fact, I used to use two endo loops. There was one I used to lie and then I had the, the coup de grace, which was actually tightening right up. And on the post-op or the interop TOE post, there was no, no flow. It made the coronaries easy and I'll show you how that works. So um, this is an off-pump coronary, so you can see you can just drop it down and you loop, loop, loop the appendage. Um, and then also you can bring, I, I bring grafts from the right side of the heart. And it's very slow, these videos, aren't they? So the, this graft is a, a radial artery uh, sewn onto right internal mammary artery coming through the transverse sinus. And it gives you a very nice uh, space to be able to do your coronary artery uh, surgery. And it's not liking this at all. It's gone slow. Got to put more money in the meter, maybe. Not working. No, it doesn't matter. So it allows you to do that, and that's what I was doing it for. And then the next thing came, well, the patient's got atrial fibrillation, um, and I said, well, we don't need to anticoagulate them in the post-operative period because their appendage is ligated. And um, then I needed some nice pictures to show my off-pump surgery, and so this is a, a lemur to the LAD, and this is the transverse sinus graph, beautiful graph. But what it shows is the ligated appendage is no longer ligated because those um, PDS endoloops uh, dissolve and they don't work, which is good. So then I added a, uh, funnily enough, industry makes the Lariat device, which has now been banned, uh, or not banned, withdrawn from, from, from sale, which is this uh, non-absorbable stitch, but we don't actually have endo loops that are made with a non-absorbable stitch. So if anyone in industry wants to make some, I think we'd be using them. But you add this to the mix and that actually removes the, uh, the issue of the, of the, the thing. And then um, what I found, obviously in the, in the, in the on-pump case, is doing valvular heart surgery. This is a left atrial appendage here. I moved from doing internal uh, suture line. Obviously, it takes time and it's not always perfect. And we've got such good stapler technology now with our thoracic surgery with these tri these tri staple technology. You can see the neck of the left atrial appendage. And uh, unfortunately, this is in slowness. But this is a real time video. It's unedited. You can see the back of my head very nicely. It shows you can pull the pull the um, the left atrial appendage up into the stapler, and um, it's a pity this is not working. Is there any reason why that's not working? This is a straight pulse. Sorry? It's a straight pulse. Oh, okay. Just wait. Is there any way you can speed it up? Sorry? Oh, I'll just keep going. It's a bit of a shame. Okay. Um, and obviously, in the off pump setting, um, I moved, they were doing, uh, it was actually one of those, I was actually concentrating at ANSCATS last year and, and, and Nico Dole has been resecting the atrial appendages in the minimally invasive fashion. You can see this, the, truth, the trick is to cock the stapler and you need to deliver the atrial appendage into the stapler at the base and then the staple is fired and then you end up with, and I've got a, some stills later on, I'll show you that. You can staple that off and it shows you. Um, and obviously minimally invasive surgery, this is a minimally invasive uh, uh, ascending aorta hemi arch, aortic valve replacement, and you can actually resect the atrial appendage for a pretty small hole as well. One of the concerns with minimally invasive heart surgery is not doing the full job, and this is one thing that concerned me when I moved to minimally invasive aortic and aortic valve surgery a few years ago, was that you couldn't do that. But certainly, uh, by pulling the heart down, you can see the, the green gloves there, pulling the heart down and actually cocking the, uh, the, uh, um, the stapler uh, up against the heart, you can resect the atrial appendage very effectively. And I actually am delivering the atrial appendage into the womb, which is a shame that this is not doing that, but anyway. Um, 
and the other thing too is obviously with um, the blue spinning wheel of death. Anyway, um, I was very organised, so this is not actually a sample case, this is just the last case I did before I came to the meeting, I had to get some images. So this is not a selected case by any stretch of the imagination, this is a 45 year old guy who had a, a, an off pump cabbage, you can see um, he's almost got this sort of chicken wing shaped appendage which is obviously this colour going through it, up here is the, the pulmonary vein. And then um, we've resected that. And you can see there's nothing there and the colour's only the pulmonary vein. There's a tiny little stump, some three millimetres or so. The definition of failure uh, is greater than a centimetre and clearly this is not the case. And I'll show you some stills of what the, uh, the stump of the atrial appendage looks like in a second. Um, the other issue too is uh, can all left atrial appendages, and the reason for this is I think it's amusing they've called it all after food, um, and uh, can all left atrial appendages be dealt with in this manner? The actual shape of the left atrial appendage really doesn't matter from a surgical point of view because what you're actually after is the neck. So they've got different, the cauliflower or the broccoli, whatever you want to call it, the windsock, cactus, uh, chicken wing, etc. We're actually going for what's going on down here. And the only uh, left atrial appendages you can't deal with, there's two of them. One is the really, really short ones and the ones with a really, really large mouth. And both of those, I think, are very low risk left atrial appendages. So I think leaving those alone are absolutely fine. So no, you can't. So basically we use the Covidian, uh, or I use the Covidian black tri-stapler. Um, and then obviously you can actually remove the left atrial appendage uh, as you see. And um, I think going forward, um, as a rival, potential to the invasive is actually minimally invasive uh, resection of left atrial appendages in patients who cannot uh, or will not tolerate. There's a certain group of patients that refuse to take anticoagulation uh, going forward. Obviously there's a risk reward uh, to this. I think it's a pretty low risk uh, procedure and certainly I've done uh, many hundreds of these now um, and if I get more organised I will present my data like the other guy has. Having said that, the procedural stroke rate in my hands for coronary surgery now is, is, has been zero. There's been some 30-day strokes, of which one is an atrial fibrillation related stroke and that predated um, resecting this. And certainly in the last five years, there's been no atrial fibrillation related strokes in the coronary surgery. There's been more than 500 cases. So that's science, I suppose, in some, in some level. Thank you. <laughs>